Good evening, everybody. I'm Alexandra Leshnikovsky, and I'm a geography and urban planning professor at Concordia University. For over 10 years now, I've been studying how society is adapting to the unavoidable consequences of a changing climate. And now I teach undergraduate courses, both to our geography students as well as our urban planning students, about the science and the public policy of climate change. Now, at the beginning of each semester, I go around the room and I ask my students in, the, in these courses to describe what kinds of words come to mind when they hear the phrase climate change, something that we all have um, you know, heard of, encountered in the news, in personal conversations. We all come into those types of classes with some sort of prior background information and emotional response to that phrase. Now, most often, my students use words like scary or extreme and existential. They see events like the 2020 floods in Pakistan or the forest fires in Alberta that are playing out right now, and they fear for what that means for their generation and for the future of our planet. And climate change is certainly those things. It is scary, and it does raise existential questions for how we continue to live in a world that's becoming hotter and less predictable every year. But I also emphasize to my students that climate change is a problem of our own making. And because of that, it means that this is a problem that we absolutely have the power and the ability to solve. So for many decades, this issue of solving the problem of climate change was really framed around the issue of prevention. Our goal was to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to levels that were low enough to avoid dangerous changes to our planet's climate system. Changes that would make it more difficult and in some places even impossible for life to continue the way that it has in the past. But now those changes are starting to happen all around us. We're seeing more frequent and more extreme heat waves like the catastrophic 2021 Canadian heat dome that killed 619 people in BC. We're seeing changes in the range of species that are bringing diseases like Lyme disease into Canadian communities. Sea level rise and storms are reshaping our coastlines. So climate action is no longer just about prevention. It's now also about trying to respond to these worsening risks. So what do these impacts mean for Canada then? First of all, we know that it's going to cost us a lot of money. Modeling from the Canadian Climate Institute has found that climate change impacts are likely to reduce Canada's GDP by up to $100 billion per year by 2050. Second of all, we know that climate change is not going to impact all of us in the same way. Those of us who are already the most marginalized in our society will likely experience the greatest harm from climate change. So for example, of those individuals who died in the 2021 BC heat wave, most were low-income seniors who were living alone. Third, we know that those who are the least responsible for the greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change will be the most impacted. So Inuit communities, for example, are warming about four times faster than the global average and are experiencing a wide range of impacts in their communities, including on things like community safety, food security, cultural traditions, and mental health. So for me, this question of why we need to adapt and how we adapt to a changing climate is really at the heart of the societal injustice that is the climate crisis. So we have to respond and we have to prepare. And this now means focusing on adaptation alongside efforts to mitigate our emissions. So when I say adaptation, what exactly does that mean? Now, in one very important sense, that means doing things to reduce the specific impacts of climate change-related risks. So, for example, it might mean creating new flood insurance policies that help to spread the costs of disasters between government and the private sector. But adaptation is also going to mean tackling big challenges that cause some people in some places to be more vulnerable than others in the first place. So we know from decades of climate change research at this point that in order to ensure that we're all benefiting from adaptation, we need to also tackle the social drivers of vulnerability. So that means addressing underlying issues like poverty, 
housing insecurity, and healthcare accessibility. These are broad issues in our society that we need to confront and deal with for a myriad of issues, reasons alongside climate change. So what this tells us is that climate change and adaptation is not just a technological problem or an infrastructure problem. It's a political and a societal challenge that calls on us to transform our society towards a more just and more equitable future. This means doing things like prioritizing marginalized people and the adaptation decisions that we make. We need to be thinking about system level changes that can address underlying injustices that create unequal burdens in a changing climate. And we also need to do the boring stuff, like creating monitoring and evaluation systems for our adaptation policies and programs that track the impacts of our actions on risk and vulnerability outcomes. There's a very clear economic argument for undertaking adaptation. For every dollar that we spend proactively adapting, we can save anywhere from seven to $15 in costs avoided over the long term. But for me, there's also a very clear moral argument for adaptation. Climate justice demands that we confront the societal and the generational injustices that define climate change vulnerability. So I am part of what pop culture refers to as an older millennial. Um, folks in my generation have come of age as we were beginning to realize that all of these consequences and impacts of climate change would probably hit us much earlier and much more severely in places like Canada than we once thought. My students' generation now is coming of age as that realization is playing out all around us. And I now have a one-year-old daughter and I know that her generation will never know a world where we aren't dealing with dangerous impacts of a changing climate. So we can try to deal with these consequences the way we're doing right now, which is you know, incrementally reacting to extreme weather events when they happen, or we can be bold and we can envision new ways of living and new ways of relating to one another in a warming world. I think I know what pathway my students would urge us to take. Thank you.